The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in trusting Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living hell will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world falls around me I rest and know That He has found me Christ the rock is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English spelling for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode entitled, Questions About God's Love, we will be scripturally exploring the issue of God's love. There are oftentimes confusion about the nature and character of God with regard to His love and our relation to Him as it pertains to the topic. There are countless questions which get raised regarding God and His love, but in this episode we will be looking at three specific questions which provide a better theological viewpoint from which to correctly understand the subject. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you have not left us to the devices of our own imaginations. We give pause to give thanks that by your grace you are able to conquer our rebellion and every sin that so easily enslaves us and brings our hearts and minds captive to the flesh. Help us now to receive your spirit by which we receive with joy the message of your word, which are the words of eternal life and of your love for us, who are called according to your pleasure. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now doubtless there are countless questions regarding God's love. However, in this episode we are going to look at three questions which represent the most common questions which people have regarding God's love. The three questions are as follows. 1. Isn't God love? 2. Doesn't God love the sinner but hate the sin? 3. Doesn't God love everyone? Now let's begin with the first one. Isn't God love? In this case, if you mean that God defines and characterizes the greatest capacity for love that is or can be known, then the answer is yes. On the other hand, if you mean that love defines God and he is limited solely to love as defined by man, then the answer is no. You see, the problem is that our definitions of love and of God must, in order to hold immutable truth, begin and end with God and not with mutable man. God is eternal and infinite, 
pure and perfect in all his attributes and characteristics. God cannot be limited or constrained by finite man in his imagination or in his language. Even those revelations given to us by God in his word are subject to being compromised by the dictates of the human heart and man as they rebel against God. So love, as defined by God, can only be understood by man as man humbles himself in submission to God's word, the Bible. When we ask questions about God or the love of God, like, isn't God love? The answer to the question, as with many others, depends on establishing a starting point and a source of authority from which we qualify the definitions. As such, we have several necessary considerations as to the question. A. Where do we start? God or man? B. Is love the only attribute of God? C. How does God define love? And D. We need to consider out-of-context theology. So let's start with the first consideration, where do we start, God or man? Starting with man, with man there is no ultimate source for authority other than man. Thus, for man, he begins and concludes his quest for the answers to such questions within himself using his own reason and intellect. The dilemma is that because of sin, human reasoning and or secular sensibilities cannot agree unanimously on anything, nor can they be objectively trusted or measured. They never have and they never will. Human reasoning only gives man the veiled hope of self-assurance and consensus at best. While percentage and consensus may give us comfort, comfort, according to even the greatest consensus available, does not equate necessarily to absolute truth or reality. The proof of this folly is that given several thousand years of human history, given the greatest of all our campaigns to unify all of man behind some single thought, purpose, or goal has left us with the fact that we are still fighting physically, ideologically, and philosophically amongst ourselves to this day as to who is right and who is wrong, or for that matter, what truth or reality we should unify behind. Insofar as the concept of love is concerned, the logical conclusion to this dilemma is for man to deify tolerance and diversity as the only true God whom they can worship. In the religion of tolerance, everyone has a valid opinion and no one is wrong. Everyone is entitled, encouraged, and supported to do what is right in their own eyes and none is to be dissuaded. Paradoxically, within this religious paradigm of tolerance, the only time it is permissible to be intolerant is when the tolerant encounter those who do not worship at the altar of tolerance, but rather at the altar of God's truths and absolutes. In the arena of man, love is ultimately constrained to a definition where every man is said to be demonstrating love when they demonstrate tolerance. Each person, in fact, reaches their spiritual zenith when they love each other person for who they are, what they are doing, how they are doing it, regardless of any constraint other than consensus. Consequently, God, if there is a God, is reduced to a God who is looking likewise for tolerance, redefined for love, and rewarding everyone for their best efforts so long as they are sincere. Now, juxtapositioned next to that, we have starting with God. God's Word, the Bible, is the final source authority for everything, including a proper biblical worldview of love. Although this declaration is very different from the idea that man is the source of authority, it is nevertheless the only alternative to which we can go if, in fact, we are sincere about establishing what God is saying versus eternally polling mankind to establish the latest consensus, culture, and trend. Instead, it is the believer's committed goal of existence to seek out and to discover God's will for their lives according to his word, the Bible, and submitting ourselves to his will. In this arena, God defines love and its various attributes, 
having established a correct ultimate source for authority, man can proceed to further search out, discuss, and answer any question, including, isn't God love? The next consideration we have is to ask the question, is love the only attribute of God? Answer, no. In order to answer the question, isn't God love, we must by necessity ask the question, is love the only attribute of God? While the Bible does clearly teach that God is characterized by love, the same Bible teaches and demonstrates that God has many attributes including holiness, justice, mercy, and righteousness. Each of these attributes, including love, are equally perfect and true. Many people become confused regarding the issue of God's love primarily due to teaching God's love out of context. In doing a survey of God's word and focusing on the topic of love as an attribute of God, we learn that there are many things which God in fact does not love, including Satan, evil, separation, and rebellion, just to name a few. In point of fact, in many places, God demonstrates attributes which, when viewed by humanistic definitions, contrast worldly sentiments. For example, look at Psalm 11.5. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Psalm 101. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside, it shall not cleave to me. Psalm 119.104 Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. From these and other scriptures, we may understand the reality that God has and is eternally exercising all of his attributes, including love, using the only perfect and holy standard in existence, himself. It is therefore God alone who is able to define, use, and exemplify standards of love which are in acceptance and conformity to himself. Any attempts on our part to artificially force our standards of love or other humanistic attributes upwards and imagine that God has adopted them is folly. While these imagined humanistic definitions of God's attributes may be heralded, applauded, and approved by the entire world, they are nonetheless failures by his own standards. A third consideration is this. Ask the question, how does God define love? Typically, as previously stated, when man asks questions related to God akin to the question, isn't God love? Man has the predisposition to define terms according to subjective, relative, humanistic definitions. But using such finite standards is like having a flawed mathematical formula. Once the calculations are done, one will inevitably arrive at a flawed conclusion. Worse yet, because man uses subjective and relative terms, each man is either using a formula which seems right in their own eyes, or he is using one which has been agreed upon based upon human consensus. One of the first rules we learn as submitted Christians is that God's definition of love flows from his own eternal perspective, not finite secular humanistic definitions. The definitions flow from an absolute moral law and an absolute moral law giver, God. With this in mind, let us look at the absolute moral law of God's word, which uses three Greek words, all of which can be translated using the English word love. First of all, we have the Greek word eros, which is defined by our English word love, but specifically means a sexual love, and is where we get our English word erotic. Secondly, we have the Greek word phileo, which is also again defined by our English word love, but specifically refers to a brotherly kind of love. And then thirdly, we have the Greek word agapeo, which again is defined by our English word love, but specifically refers to a selfless, sacrificial type of love. So, from God's perspective, the Bible reveals that the primary goal of God's love is to redeem his creation to fellowship with himself. 
Nowhere in Scripture is God said to experience or be motivated by an eros type of love. In every case, God may be found to be motivated by either akopeo, a sacrificial, selfless love, or in some cases possibly by phileo, brotherly love. Unregenerate man does not share the same eternal perspective of God. Instead, mankind is consumed by the temporal perspectives. While many of these concerns may be noble, good, and kind in their own right, few, if any, of them have any impact on eternal outcome because God's priorities are moving towards the eternal and not primarily focused or fixed on the temporal. Consequently, many perceive God as being unloving towards their fleshly concerns. The truth is that in every case that while the various circumstances, concerns, and priorities of human existence may, from an earthly perspective, seem to be the highest good and importance, from an eternal perspective, they are like nothing in comparison to the reality of God's eternal perspective. It is only from this eternal perspective that God alone can be said to be in a position to know, to be motivated, and to do what can be defined as quote-unquote love. A final consideration is that of using out-of-context theology. Using the ruler of the ultimate authority of God's word, it is simple enough to identify blatant, atheist, agnostic, or cultic views about God. What is ultimately more difficult is unraveling those views of God which have elements of truth but which have been taken out of context or compromised with humanistic or pagan philosophies in order to make God more palatable for secular man. First, as we talk about -about out-of-context theology, we have what I would call gods at odds. One example which has become a classic misnomer among many people is the idea that there is one God who is a God of wrath and anger of the Old Testament, commonly associated with Judaism, and another separate God who showed up some 4,000 years later, named Jesus, who is a God of love, commonly associated with Christianity. Further, this misnomer sees one God who is polarized from the other both in nature and purpose, But the truth of the totality of scripture in context reveals something about God which is very different from this view. Instead, we learn from scripture's clear revelation that there is one God who has and does reveal himself in three distinct aspects or offices known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this respect, understanding the various aspects of God's nature is like the proverbial blind men each of whom grabs onto a different appendage belonging to an elephant. One man may grab the trunk and conclude that the elephant is like a large fire hose. Another grabs the leg and concludes an elephant is like the trunk of a tree. The third grabs the tail and concludes an elephant is like a rope. So it is with theology. People look at various attributes of God and conclude that God is limited and defined by one particular attribute rather than the whole. In the case of Jesus, people look at his birth, his ministry, and death, and conclude, based on his isolated earthly ministry, that God is exclusively and solely limited in every respect throughout eternity to whatever attributes they believe they see in that specific earthly capacity. To be more specific, many people look at the fact that Jesus' ministry clearly emphasizes his capacity to love as well as his desire for us to love others and forget all else. This group will protest the suggestion that God is anything but pure love alone and gravitate to verses like John 3.16, for example, and repeat, quote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Well, to look at this verse and its meaning in context, like our previous analogy, gives us a clearer perspective of the elephant before us. The remainder of the verse from John 3.16 continues and states, That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The second portion of this verse provides the qualifying reason and motivation 
behind God sending his son. Ultimately, we have the revelation that Jesus came motivated by love, justice, and mercy to save those who will, by God's grace, respond by faith to this offer of redemption. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 50, we have uh, a parable which tells an interesting truth which is closely related. Quote, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, who when he hath found one pearl of great price, went, and sold all that he had, and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net, that was cast into the sea, and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to the shore, and sat down, and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. At this point, let us ask two additional questions, which will help our understanding. The second question is, doesn't God love the sinner, but hate the sin? And thirdly, doesn't God love everyone? While these are two separate questions, the theology wrapped around answering either question is closely related, if not identical. A common theological misnomer is that God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. Or that God loves everyone with only one type of love. Neither idea can be supported by scripture in context. The idea that God loves the sinner, but hates the sin or that he loves everyone conflicts with many scriptures including Revelation chapter 20 verse 15 which says quote, and if anyone's name was not found in the book of life he was thrown into the lake of fire unquote. now if God genuinely loves the sinner but hates the sin or loves everyone then how and why are sinners cast into the furnace of eternal torment In the end, it's not just sins which are cast into the lake of fire. It is sinners who are punished because of their choice to rebel. Likewise, it was not sin that was crucified on the cross alone. Jesus was crucified on the cross, and he took our sins upon himself. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 45 give additional insight. Quote, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous." In this verse, there is little doubt Jesus is not simply recommending we love our enemies. He is commanding the love of enemies. He does so on the basis of the Father's general love and benevolence to all. But there is a qualitative difference between the common love and benevolence and the special love of God to his own leading to salvation. Christ defines two levels of love. First, there is the common love of God manifested to all. Then there is a special love which Christ has for his people. It differs from this common love of benevolence For example, I can have a general love, concern, and desire for welfare of all children, but as a father, I have a very special love based upon a relationship for my own children. I would be willing to sacrifice generally for all children, but I am much more apt to sacrifice without restraint for my own children. While the common love we have mentioned is a benevolence you may carry out with your neighbor and your enemy, the special love which binds together the body of Christ is a love only produced by Christ. The same analogy can be seen in the model of biblical marriage. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 through 27, quote, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless." The love of husbands for their wives is to be a mirror of the love of Christ for the church. 
Now, without doubt, the love of husbands is not indiscriminate. Husbands are not to love other women in the same way they love their wives. In like manner, the love Christ has for the church is special, discriminating, narrow, directed only towards the church, and the result of this love is the sanctification of the church. Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 13 give pause to the idea that God loves everyone when it says, quote, And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, and had not yet done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose according to his choice might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it was written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. Unquote. God's discriminating love falls upon Jacob and is withheld from Esau. Esau is hated. The standard rebuttal to these very hard words is then addressed by Paul in Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 17, when he says, quote, What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills, or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. Unquote. In this instance, we see, by example, that God is not unjust. The special compassion of God which saves sinners is a matter of mercy. It is not a matter of merit. Mercy is not something owed to any sinner. God's special love is bestowed upon some in his sovereign discretion, and God passes by others. These verses give the clear theological reality which flies in the face of the universalistic notion that God is saving everyone. Instead, God's motivation of love in sending Jesus is not for the world generically, any more than it was the motive in the parable for the field, the pearls, or the sea. Rather, God's motivation is specifically for those in the world who will respond by faith. The same Jesus who came motivated by love to seek and to save that which was lost will return in another capacity and office as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to judge the living and the dead. In the above parable, those who were not purchased by Christ are left behind in the field. Those who are not gathered by his grace in the net of salvation due to their choice to remain in rebellion and sin are cast into the furnace of fire. We all were at one time headed to be cast into the furnace. But the good news is that by God's grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are covered by his righteousness from the wrath that is to come. For those who respond, there is love, peace, joy, reconciliation, and eternal life. Many will say, well, I don't believe that. Well, we are free to believe what we want. However, the strongest belief, individually, or compounded by the consensus, does not equate to, or affect, ultimate authority and reality. The ultimate authority of God's word says, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, quote, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, unquote. The reality of this verse and of ultimate authority reveals that we are not just referring to earthly death and nothingness as the heathen imagine, but rather eternal separation, anguish, and suffering. Viewing this through the spectacles of finite human sensibilities and definitions, some will conclude by crying, well, that's just not very loving. Well, looking at a speeding truck headed to run you over is never an enjoyable view. Someone screaming at you saying, get out of the way, you're going to be run over, rarely comes off as sounding pleasant. But it is preferable to see truth and be warned than to never know and to perish.
In this case, it's just reality, because when the time comes that one is finally faced with eternity, and sees the truth and beauty of God and his kingdom, there can be no other reaction than to experience the ultimate pain and torment to realize that because of your choice and our own pride and rebellion that you are forever separated from that beauty and that eternal life in the presence of God. If you are alive and if you are hearing the ultimate authority of God's word then there is still time. There is no place, there is no situation, no problem no sin that can separate us from God's love other than our own rebellion to open our heart and turn to him. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 says, quote, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Unquote. Father, I thank you that you have chosen to reveal yourself to those who would seek you out by your word and by your spirit. I thank you that you have called us, that the precious blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, has saved us by grace, through faith, and that your spirit seals us unto the day where we might kneel before your throne and give you honor, glory, and praise forevermore. Amen. Now, if you have been listening in past, as you know, I take questions uh, regarding the Bible, God, and the Christian faith, and seek by scripture to answer any questions that you have. So, if you have a question about these things, I would encourage you to send an email to Pastor Yeshua, that's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com Thank you for listening. The world falls around me I rest and know that He has found me Christ the rock is my foundation I will trust in Him I will trust in Him I will trust in you.